Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Gabriel, so tell me what happened. You bought a couple of rental properties and things didn't really work out too well. What what happened? The kicker with these is that we bought them with tenants in place. So the motivation of the seller was rooted in a lot of the tenant complications he was having. And uh, we adopted those complications when we purchased them. And so, you know, one of the tenants was very, very um, inconsistent with her rent payments. And it was like pulling teeth. She also lived in a unit that had floors caving in. A lot of the subfloors were really moist and there was some crawl space uh, moisture. And just over time, the position of the lot uh, gave way to a lot of issues that just weren't addressed in a timely manner. And so, yeah, I adopted some physical issues in the, at the property, needed a rehab, and also the, uh, the tenant problems just with some of the rent delinquency. So I, I guess eventually you just got fed up, you sold that property, you bought something else, and that property also had some problems. What, what happened with your <laughs> second property? Yeah, yeah, the second property two duplexes and I bought those together on on a on bridge financing so it, you know I had the intention of renovating these these units but all four units had tenants in place and so again you know it, it went pretty well for the first few months and I was in there doing all my renovations uh, repairing the foundation you know putting a lot of money in so I wanted the tenants to see look you know maybe over the years the prior owner, didn't take care of you, didn't address the issues that that you had told them that they needed to address. And now I'm coming in and I'm doing that stuff. But, you know, still yeah. that uh, that appreciation didn't really last. Rent began um, trickling in less and less. And I even ran into a a threat of a lawsuit. I think I, uh, I had a con artist on my hands in one of the units who kind of came out of nowhere. I, I always tell people if they're on the fence about buying a rental or not buying a rental that they should just do it because worst case, if you don't like it, you can always sell and you can always get out of it and you just never know what it'll lead to. And th- this story actually has a happy ending, right? Like you actually found a, a property eventually that's working out really well. Between those two properties, you know, seven units in total, we we netted over six figures on on a, those collectively. So that helped me, you know, get a get a boost, um, set me on a trajectory to buy my wife and I's uh, first primary residence, which has an Airbnb attached to it, and that Airbnb grosses, you know, over fifty thousand dollars a year. That covers our living spin, expense in its entirety. So. Yeah, big win there and wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't taken calculated risk on the first seven units. On the podcast today, I want to get some more details on what exactly went wrong with Gabriel's first two purchases. I want to see if these were maybe just really bad properties and they wouldn't have worked out for anybody or if Gabriel maybe made some mistakes and didn't do things right. So we'll get some details and see what we can figure out. I also want to get some more details on his Airbnb because it sounds like this is really profitable. So let's take a really quick break. We'll thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll meet Gabriel Johnson from Charleston, South Carolina. If you're looking for a quick and easy way to finance a rental property, reach out to Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She has a loan program where she only cares about your deal. She doesn't need to see your pay stubs, your bank statements, or your tax returns. The only thing she's going to look at is the deal. She wants to know, does the property cash flow? If it does, she'll give you a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Now, the rates are going to be a little bit higher than a full doc loan, but it's still a great deal. She can close quickly and there's no hassle. If you want to learn more, reach out to Chaley personally at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. Rental Income Podcast. Let's start off talking about that first property you bought. I want to see if there's anything that maybe you could have done differently to make things work. The first thing I'm thinking of is that if you had maybe bought that property vacant or you had bought the property and gotten rid of all the tenants and you could have done a rehab right at the beginning, do you think that would have made a difference? These were, you know, the first rental property 
acquisitions that I made. And so I was determined to close on them and not let anything stand in my way. So I didn't let the conventional financing restrictions limit me. So we put together the seller financing uh, uh, agreement. And after that, it was really just the fact that these tenants, you know, they were in place and I could have negotiated a maybe a 30 to 60 day um, vacancy period so that, you know, while we were in escrow, the tenants would have been required to find uh, new housing. And I could have even helped them through that process. Mm -hmm. But on the front end, I was so motivated to close on these properties. I didn't want that to hinder the seller from selling them to me. Right. So, and I think it, it potentially would have, he did not want to displace them. I don't think he wanted to deal with it. So, but yes, ultimately, yes, it would have been very helpful to purchase you know, the property is vacant. It's kind of a double edged sword because the idea of buying a property that already has tenants in there and on day one, you have cash flow. Like th that's very appealing to, to buy a property that's going to be making you money on day one. But it, it sounds like if if you had actually forgone that rent and picked your own tenant and rehabbed the property and, and just made it better, that that would have had a maybe a better ending. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly say so. I, I feel like when you're in escrow, it's kind of like, you know, it's the locker room period. You have time to strategize. You have time yeah. to put together your contractors and your team and, and uh, you know, you get to basically put into motion your business plan. You know, right. when it comes to commercial real estate, we all have a, a business plan to add value and create equity. And I mean, same goes in residential, you, you know, you want to have a, your business plan in place and from day one, you can put it into motion. And so really the main way to do that a lot of times with, with uh, you know, these residential rental properties is going in from day one, and uh, renovating and, yeah. you know, creating the possibility of higher rents and creating the possibility of having um, stable cash flow without the constant calls coming in that something else is falling apart. Right. Right. And, and, and so is that what happened? Like you were just getting constant calls and constant aggravation? Yeah. Yeah. And I knew because I was taking the risk of buying properties that needed work with tenants in place that I would potentially run into that. Yeah. It was really with one property, one of one of the three in particular. The other two were Section 8. And so the prior owner was held accountable by yearly inspections by the housing authority. And so he kept those kept those up because, you know, it, his rent coming in was dependent upon him, you know, taking care of the issues that uh, arose with each annual inspection. So with a third property, though, it wasn't Section 8, and and so for that reason, he neglected a lot of these issues, and they piled up over time. Um, a lot of issues arose from the crawl space. Um, a lot of moisture developed down there. There wasn't uh, moisture uh, mediation, and so it was kind of like, you know, just it rotted out some of the subfloors. Um, some of the floors were caving in a little bit, a little bit wavy. And uh, over time, that kind of drooped the framing, messed with the drywall. Um, I had to, you know, navigate all of that. So now, would you say that these were C class properties? Yeah, okay. yeah, I'd say. Okay, I'd say they were so C -class. a C class property in a C class neighborhood, and it it sounds like you, you got the properties really cheap, and I I think that's probably what saved you here in the end because you ended up selling these properties and making some money on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. So, so we were able to, I, I think in the long run, since I was working with some pretty affordable uh, contractors, you know, we're able to uh, clear 40,000 on the back end. So yeah, we made, we made some money on them. And um, I think we held them for six months. And, you know, these were actually on long term debt, we, they would have been paid off in, in nine years at only 4% interest. So it was really strong financing, but just with the position I was in in life and, you know, the trajectory I wanted to be on in my real estate career, I thought that, you know, the $40,000 of liquidity could be reinvested into more marketing and the deal flow would just yeah. continue to grow from and, there. 
that really shows how important it is to to buy right. People always say you make your money when you buy a property. And in your case, that's so true. If you had paid too much for this property, you may have been in a situation where you had to bring money to close or, you know, maybe you, you wouldn't be able to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, and when you're, when you're working in a market where you can pick up three properties for $25,000 a door, you know, you don't really see the same appreciation, whether it's, you know, just natural with uh, market pressures or if it's forced. So, you know, like we mentioned earlier, you can have a business plan in place, but there's potentially going to be more meat on the bone as you're adding value in a market that sees higher appreciation than in a market, you know, that it's still possible to buy for, you know, 25,000 to 50,000 a door versus hundreds of thousands. Right. So, all right. So you bought these properties, 25,000 a door. So all in, it was $75,000 for three properties. How much was the combined rent? Yeah, the combined rent. So it was five fifty a door. And so we were at sixteen fifty total. Okay. I mean, those are great numbers. Like, so on a spreadsheet, if you're looking at this deal, I feel like a lot of investors would love to buy a deal like that where they can buy a property for seventy five grand and rent it for sixteen fifty. But after going through this experience, do you feel like those twenty five thousand dollar properties are maybe just something that you should stay away from unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah. And so it's that last piece is most important because I was in my six, first six months of my real estate career. And so if I knew what I knew now and I had my processes, my strategy in place, um, I, you know, I would take those down in a heartbeat now yeah. and feel a whole lot more confident, you know, to being an operator and setting into motion the next nine years of management with, you know, while I'm relatively hands off, but I, you know, I didn't really have the, uh, at the time, I don't think I had the wherewithal to make that happen. I was kind of just, you know, taking the punches as they came sure. and adapting, um, and learning a lot along the way. All right. So. Well, I mean that, that has a happy ending, although it, it sounded like it, it, it wasn't the best experience when you're going through it. You sold the properties, you made some money, and then you decided to do it again. You you bought another property. Tell me about the second property you bought. Yeah, so the second property I bought was two adjacent duplexes on one parcel in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I bought the two of these for $145,000. And I bought them with tenants in place. Okay. Each of the each of the tenants were paying five fifty uh, a month. Now, was it a similar situation where there was a lot of deferred maintenance? Less so here than in the uh, original three that I purchased. There was one pretty major foundation issue that I needed to address, but that was on the exterior wall, so I was able to do that. While at the same time, you know, it wasn't very invasive. We had crews uh, with ramjack outside putting in helical pilings into the ground and kind of lifting up that corner of one of the duplexes. So some deferred maintenance uh, on the on the inside. But a lot of what I did was kind of just beautifying it from from the outside in. And, uh, you know, for what they were paying in rent, I think the units were in pretty good shape. Okay. And what was the total rent on the two duplexes? Yeah. So when I first bought them, it was uh five fifty a door. So we were looking at twenty two hundred dollars. Twenty two hundred. Okay. And you bought it for one forty five? One forty five okay. with bridge debt, uh just like before. All um right. so or you... not not like before. I'm sorry. The other was seller financing. This one was bridge debt. And so my monthly payment was a little bit higher. It was about eleven fifty a month, um, at least until I refinanced them. So, was your plan with this property to do a burr? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So you're going to fix the property up, increase the rents, refi into your long term debt. So, what 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 happened? I mean, this deal sounds like it's pretty good. What, where did things go wrong with this one? Um, with this one, I ran into a <laughs> one of the tenants, uh, he had, you know, basically been added to the lease while I was under contract to close. I, uh, 
I told the the, the seller, I need uh, leases written up for all the properties. If you can't find the lease, have a new one written up on a month to month basis. And so she did that. And she included this gentleman who ended up having a long record and uh, he had been evicted many times for the, from other properties and he had a criminal record and uh, was basically running a drug ring out of the, the property. And eventually he tried to um, write a letter threatening a lawsuit saying that he fell down, a, down the stairs because a handrail was loose, which ironically enough was the day that I had crews out there basically doing everything under the sun that it would have avoided uh, an issue like that. And so they were replacing handrails, although this handrail was not broken. I'd been there that, uh, that week. So, all right. So he was trying to take advantage of you. So you've got to deal with that. Did, did you, did you have to hire a lawyer or did you not even take it seriously? Well, he was so insistent um, that over time, uh, you know, months would go by and he's still reaching out to me on new cell phone numbers and, and uh, you know, sending me new threats. And, and so it got to the point where, you know, I, I needed to deal with either him or I needed to offload the property. And, uh, you know, I had a long term vision for these uh, for these units. But at the same time, because my day to day real estate um, venture is is more transactional. I buy, I sell, we bring crews in and we flip. We've done, you know, 35 or so flips in the past uh, year and a half. And so I'm so used to working in the transactional world that it's, you know, when I run into an issue like this, it's tempting to say, okay, I've created, you know, 50 grand of equity and I'm going to sell and I'm going to treat it like a flip. And so I, I'm not going to say that that's the right way to, you know, to view it on a long-term outlook, yeah. but you know, I learned a lot just in terms of the the tenant quality the um the class of neighborhood the class of property and so you know i think i've learned that i want to maybe steer clear of the c and d class and you know kind of invest more into short term rentals or something that yeah. would be deemed more a or b class all right so let's talk about what what happened next so you decided to to sell those two properties after you sold those properties you bought a property to live in and now you're renting out part of your house on Airbnb. Tell me how the house is set up. Yeah, yeah. So the house is on James Island, South Carolina, uh, about 10 minutes from the beach, about 10 minutes uh, from downtown Charleston. Charleston's a destination city that sees tourism uh, really all throughout the year. So, you know, we have a, a few winter months that are a little bit colder where it slows down a bit. But for the most part, you know, I can trust that I have year round uh, short term renters coming in. So the house is broken up into a ranch style bottom floor. And then on the right side of the house, you go around the back and there is a second story deck. You go up some stairs, enter in the back door and you have a two bedroom, one bath attached dwelling unit. ADU and accessory dwelling unit, but this one is an, ex, uh, an attached ADU and um, yeah, you can only access it through the back door. And has this been working out a lot better than, than the other rentals? <laughs> yes. Yes. And 100%. so because you have people coming on vacation. They're there for a few days. You, you probably have uh, just an easier person to deal with. And you don't have any payment problems. I mean, because they, they're paying you before they move in. So it, it just sounds like a, a better situation all around. Yeah, yes. In every way, it's a better situation. Yeah. I, I mean, the people that, that you meet when they're in your Airbnb are in the happiest state that you're going to see them, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, potentially at it, it, any time of their lives. You know, there's some special moments in your life. And being together with your family on vacation especially in a more intimate setting, you know, it's like it, it, just a few people come at a time. There's not massive groups that can come because it's only a two bedroom. And so, yeah, I think on so many levels, it's just, you're setting people up to kind of just relax, 
ease into it. They've already paid. And for the most part, they're, you know, out at the beach. They're in downtown Charleston. They're exploring. And so, yeah, you know, we see them in the mornings. We see them in the evenings. And a lot of times we have, you know, really fun time getting to know them. And, uh, and you know, it's it's really, I think, on every level. It's just really great experience. Does it add a lot of hassle or just work in your day-to-day life to deal with people inquiring about the property or dealing with getting the cleaning done? Like, do you feel like it's just added an extra thing to do every day to your life? No, no, not at all. We have a, uh, a woman that we pay $300 a month flat fee, which comes out to less than 10% of what we're grossing per month to manage everything. She sends out, all of the welcome emails or all the welcome messages through Airbnb or VRBO. She, you know, deals with any issues that arise. She orders all the supplies. She manages scheduling with the cleaners. And so I, my wife and I could go out of town for a month and trust that everything is set into motion and it will continue smoothly with her operating it. Wow. That's great. So really you don't have to be involved at all. Like she's handling everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here and there, you know, if, if, if some kind of maintenance issue arises, I have the option to go deal with it myself or she can schedule a handyman to go in. So, you know, those are the times when maybe, you know, I decide to be more hands on, but other than that, it's really at our own pace. If we want to connect with the people that are up there, then, you know, we can do so. We're just downstairs. So it's really easy to, maybe add to their experience in that way, just by having those, those uh, face-to-face conversations and getting to know them a little bit and giving them recommendations. But that, uh, that's all kind of built into the system yeah. with our manager who's in place. And so financially, it sounds like it's doing great. You're able to cover the mortgage with the yeah. Airbnb money. And so it's, it's consistently paying the mortgage. It is. Yes. And, uh, What's more, I mean, we're we're looking at as really inflation hits and as everything's getting a little bit more expensive, you know, it, it it's difficult because, you know, it, when consumer confidence lives, I'm not going to I'm going to I'm not going to try to say that I understand all these market pressures that are yeah. that are hitting us right now. But, you know, it, it seems like with hotel prices going up in Charleston and with everything getting a little bit more expensive, you know. Our debt is fixed, but the nightly rates will continue to grow, kind of mm-hmm. like long term rentals. You know, you're going to see rents climb in this and in, uh, in these days the same way that you're you're seeing short term. So, right. I mean, that's really the great thing with all rentals in general is that y- your debt is fixed and the, the rents are going to be going up, you know, as as we experience more inflation. So it, it's really, really a beautiful thing. So, uh, yeah. so do you think you would ever do a long-term rental again or after your experience with Airbnb, do, do you think you, you'll just stick to that in the future? Yeah, I could definitely see us having a, you know, pretty diversified portfolio of, of both long and short-term rentals. Okay. I will say that I do not think that a tenant will ever have my personal cell phone number again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I will ever be the initial point of contact with yeah. a long-term tenant ever again. And I think that from day one, I want to have a property manager in place that I know, that I trust, that has strong reporting, that has you know a legal team who has a really high quality in-house maintenance team. Really, there's just so much that I, you know, the standards that I have now for management is just higher than uh, than when we originally started. I think that's a great way to do it. That's exactly how I manage my rentals. I don't think my tenants even know my name. Well, Gabriel, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you uh, being so honest and open with us today. If anybody is in the Charleston, South Carolina area, or if you're interested in investing in that area, Gabriel is a full-time realtor and he would be happy to connect with you. I've got his contact information on the website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 384. I'd like to thank today's sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Jaylee Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. 
Chaley is a nationwide lender, and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you want to set up a time to talk to Chaley personally, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com, NMLS 42056. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. Make sure you follow the show. We put out a new interview every single Tuesday. And if you're following the show, you'll get notified as soon as the next episode comes out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.